I want to talk a little bit tonight about gifts. If y'all brought any with you, you can drop them off at my car after church. Uh, everybody's looking strange, but I'm not going to talk about that kind of gifts. I want to talk about <coughs> spiritual gifts tonight. Uh, the title of the lesson is That Which is Perfect. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if, if we begin there, uh, it says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now about a faith, faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. The early church and the beginning of Christianity uh, had miracles abounding. And I know Al had talked to me one day about talking to a fellow that he knew, uh, actually beating on the steering wheel, wasn't he, Al? He, he was a steering wheel beater because if you didn't agree with him or saw things his way, he got real aggravated. But they were talking about gifts uh, amongst other things. and. Uh, when I done this lesson, I kind of thought about Al and the, the fellow that he had had a conversation with. Uh, the early church and the beginning of Christianity, as I said, had miraculous things and miracles abounding uh, by the apostles. So does that mean that today we still have miracles in the church because they had them in the first century? No, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't in any way mean. I believe the Bible teaches that we don't, and what I want to look at is why we don't. You know, a lot of people still believe that people possess miraculous abilities, and we need to be able to defend why we don't believe and why the Bible teaches against such. You know, there's some verses in the Bible that are interpreted differently by different people. Uh, let's just face it, we, we can read a scripture and someone else read it, and they come up with a, their whole different meaning of what that scripture means. Uh, we always talk about rightly dividing the Word of God, and what does that mean? Well, it means looking at a scripture in the way God would have us to look at it. If we uh, look at a scripture and take it out of context, then it doesn't align itself with the other parts of the Bible that speak on the same thing. We know we've taken it out of context. The whole Bible is the Word of God. It's breathed by God, so every word has to be true. So every scripture that we use has to align with every scripture containing or surrounding that particular thing that's being talked about. It has to be the same. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that a person who interprets a passage different from you or I doesn't mean that they're dishonest. It doesn't mean that they're stupid. Uh, but it does mean that one or, uh, or the other of us, or perhaps both of us, may be looking at it in a wrong way. Uh, we can't, if there's different interpretations of the Scripture, we can't all be right. But guess what? We could all be wrong. It doesn't say we are. I'm just saying we have to interpret the Bible in the way that God would have us to be. Uh, what needs to be done to keep us from interpreting the Bible in a wrong way? Well, study for one. We need to study God's Word again so we don't take Scriptures out of context, that it is aligned with other Scriptures in the Bible. Uh, and, and that's the case which I got as the title of this lesson today. 1 Corinthians... Uh, whoops. I'm sorry, went one too many. 1 Corinthians 13 and 10, uh, which says, But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. Now there's a lot of inter interpretation about this scripture. 
There's a lot of misinterpretation uh, about this scripture. The Apostle Paul was the first to pe preach Christ in the city of Corinth. And we talked a little bit about that in the class this morning as we're in 1 Corinthians in the early chapters. But he was the uh, first to preach Christ in the city of Corinth. And we, we know that the city of Corinth was a horrid city. It was a port city. There was a lot of things going on. Idol worship. There was a lot of uh, sexual immorality going on. Uh, and, and Paul was the first to preach Christ in that city that we're aware of that's recorded for us. Uh, and it's recorded in uh, really in the 18th chapter of Acts. It really goes into detail uh, about Paul and his preaching there. Now, despite the, the persecution by the Jews, and we know that in those early days, Christians were being persecuted. Uh, they were being killed. They were being persecuted. But despite that persecution uh, by the Jews, Paul stayed there in Corinth more than a year and a half. Can you imagine preaching the gospel in a place where they didn't believe in God? They worshipped idols. And they hated anything to do with God. Uh, and he feared for his life at every turn, but he stayed there a year and a half preaching the gospel to those folks there in Corinth. And as a result of that, many of the Corinthians heard and they believed his preaching and were subsequently baptized and became members of the church. Now, in charging the apostles to preach the gospel to every creature, Jesus promised... In, in Mark 16 and 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So on the strength of that promise by the Son of God himself, we have no choice but to believe. If we're going to believe the word of God, uh, that those Corinthians who obeyed the gospel there were saved. Uh, not only were they saved, they were God's people. They were God's church there in Corinth. Uh, earlier, Paul had said some pretty strong things to him, and, and we're just getting into that in our, our Sunday morning Bible study in the early books of, of 1 Corinthians. But Paul had said some strong things to the Corinthians. If we look in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verse 9 and 10, it says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. What's he doing? He's just putting it all out on the line. If you're in, involved in, in one of these groups, guess what? You're not going to enter into the kingdom of God. You have to change. You have to be obedient to the gospel. Your life has to change uh, in order to, to be in God's kingdom. If you fall in those categories, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, these early Christians in Corinth, uh, their conversion to the Lord's church was a radical change for them. Uh, again, they lived in a port city. A lot of people came. A lot of people went. A lot of crime. A lot of idol worship. A lot of uh, immorality, sexual and otherwise. Uh, I would suppose that people that come out of that background and listening to Paul preach the gospel of Christ and feeling that tug in their heart and wanting to maybe uh, be obedient to the gospel and have a hope of heaven, they had a lot of questions uh, for Paul. Uh, I'm sure that many of them did. And Paul addressed some of the questions in his letter to them. But we have to keep in mind that Paul is not just giving his advice like we would give someone advice if they ask us a question. Paul is actually, uh, he wrote to them, uh, and it's to be considered as a command from God. Uh, the Bible is inspired, it's breathed of God. It's not just Paul's advice, it's commands that he's related through the Word of God. Uh, many of the problems and questions dealt with relationships, especially with one another, with fellow Christians. Uh, I must add, though, that Paul's writings did not divide uh, the writings of 1 Corinthians or any other epistle that he wrote into chapters and verses. Man did that to make it easier to study uh, the Word of God. Uh, 
there wasn't chapters, there wasn't verses as far as with the name chapter 1, chapter 2, and verse 1, 2, and so on. Uh, man did that to make it easier to study the Bible. It did not change any of the wordings of the Bible. It just made it easier to go to. We could now quote scriptures. We can say, well, Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians over in chapter 3, verse 10. It's easy to find. It's easy to study. It's easy to recall. Um, as we get over to chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians, he begins to talk about really what I wanted to talk about tonight, and that is these gifts, these spiritual gifts. Uh, and as he starts off, he tells them, I would not have you be ignorant. And that's concerning these spiritual gifts. Uh, and he tells them that there are diversities of gifts, which actually means there's different kinds of gifts. Uh, then he goes on and says, but by the same Spirit, and that they are different ministries, but by the same Lord. So it's like we standing here today saying there's everybody's uh, is called uh, to work for God. Not everybody answers that call. Everybody has a calling, but not everyone will open their heart and answer that call. And even those that do answer that call and become a child of God, everyone has the ability to do something for God. We're all not going to do the same thing, are we? We have different talents, uh, different ways that we can work for God. So it's a diverse reaction as among Christians is what they can do and how can they, they can use their talents. Well, in these spiritual gifts, there were different types of gifts. Uh, he goes on to say that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each. Uh, and I want you to understand this last part of this verse. It says for the profit of all. Now, when we get to really talking about the kinds of spirits, what, what were these gifts really for? It, it was for the profit of all. Uh, so to understand what we're studying, it is important to remember that whatever gift that those Christians received, it was not for themselves. It was not for their glory. It was not for their use. It was not to give them more standing in the community or, or to rival against one another and say, oh, my gift is better than yours. Look, I've got the gift of healing. you just got the gift of tongues. Uh, it wasn't for that at all. Uh, to be understood, the gifts were for the profit of all and the glory of God. It wasn't to feed the person's pride or their ego. It wasn't for building up uh, members of, of the church just to say, hey, I've got a gift and you don't, so I must be better than you. God has blessed me more because I've got this gift. Uh, whether it was knowledge, whether it was healing, whether it was tongues, whatever the gift was, it came from the same Spirit, Paul says, to distribute as he saw fit for the good of all. Uh, now, the reason there was some problems with these gifts was, uh, as I said, some preferred or wanted particular gifts. They thought it was more important to have some of the more, they thought, important gifts that could be seen by people. Uh, some people wanted to talk in tongues. Some people wanted the gift of healing people. After all, if you walked up to a blind man and, and healed him and restored his sight, man, that was... a pretty spectacular thing. If you just walked up and, and, and spoke in tongues a little bit, uh, may not have impressed them as much as healing someone that had been blind since birth. And so as, as a consequence, some of these folks uh, got to thinking that maybe they're just a little more important because they got put more importance on certain gifts. And we do know that in the very beginning, apostles uh, from the day of Pentecost possess these gifts. Now, they were allowed to pass on these gifts to faithful uh, Christian men, but that was as far as it went. Nobody else could pass them on. When that person died, then he could never, or in his lifetime, he could never pass them on. The only person or people that could pass on these gifts was by the laying of hands and prayer by the apostles that possessed these gifts. They give them to people that they felt would do right by them, uh, but then those people could not pass them on. They seem to have forgotten some of those folks that had these gifts that all who possessed these gifts were to work together. 
that they were not to work independently and that no one was more important than the other person and that all worked together for one common goal and that was for the good of all and for the glory of God. Now Paul ends out the 12th chapter with the thought, earnestly desire the best gift. And no doubt some of these folks were desiring that best gift, but not for the right reason. Some of them were wanting it for notoriety. Uh, he goes on to say, and I show you a more excellent way. Uh, for wanting the more excellent, uh, the best gift. Remember, all they possessed was, was for the glory of God. It wasn't for their benefit. They were to desire the best, and so to do their best for the Lord and His will uh, was what God intended for them to have the gifts uh, to begin with. Uh, Paul starts out chapter 13 with the beginning of, it says, the more excellent way. Uh, there are several gifts spoken about in, in chapter 13. The gift of wisdom, gift of knowledge, the gift of faith, the gift of tongues, gift of prophecy, the gift of healing. Uh, these gifts were dispensed by the Holy Spirit uh, to the apostles and they were dispensed uh, through laying of hands and prayer, as I said earlier, to other people. And there's no doubt that these gifts were of a miraculous nature because of what transpired and the healings they did and the things they accomplished. Uh, they were to be used for the work of the Lord to uh, give Him glory and for the edification of all. And, and that's the building up and edifying of the early church and that's how it was done. I want you to keep in mind they did not have uh, during that particular time the written Bible as we have today. They did not. Uh, they listened to the apostles preach as they went around and done mission work and as uh, they appointed elders and, and people of the congregations to continue on their work when they moved to another area to, to mission work and set up another congregation. So what they had as, as scripture was what was being taught to them by the apostles. Uh, these gifts were to be used for the work of the Lord. Uh, I believe Paul makes it very clear that these gifts were only temporary because if we go back to 1 Corinthians 13, if I can get that change, uh, 8 to 10, he says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. What is that which is perfect? Well, a lot of people today said, well, it refers to Jesus because he was perfect. Well, Jesus never come in part. He was perfect from the very beginning. And Jesus had already walked the earth. Uh, he died his sacrificial death and sits on the right hand of God. He had already been here. So it says, uh, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. Jesus didn't come in part. He came perfect to begin with. So it could not be about Jesus. What does God say about his word? He calls it the perfect law of liberty. That which is perfect. Uh, now the word perfect as used means complete are finished. It doesn't uh, mean anything about dictionary meanings today. It simply means that which is perfect, that which is complete, or that which is finished. They didn't have the finished Bible at that time. They didn't have the finished. There was a few letters floating around. There was Old Testament letters, but they didn't have all of the New Testament. If Paul is preaching the gospel, what law are they under? in the early church, the New Testament. They didn't have the written word. They had the testimony and the, the prophecies uh, and the gifts to, sh to show that they were from God. They were serving a purpose. So uh, the word perfect means complete or finished. It comes from a root word, teleos. So whatever it was, that, which, uh, that would be complete or finished when it came was only partial at the time that Paul wrote this letter. It couldn't have been finished already, or he'd said, we already have it finished. But he said, we only have it in part. And that when it is finished, it'll be over with. So whatever it was, it, it wasn't finished at that particular time. Now we know what 
that nothing can be partial and complete at the same time. It's just, you can't do it. Uh, we can't uh, have a half a uh, congregation full of people in here and say that it's full. It, it just doesn't work that way. Whatever's partial cannot be complete. So revelation and knowledge and prophecy was being dispensed to the, to the people in part. Uh, it was in a developmental process, so to speak. It was in the early stages because that which was perfect had not yet uh, come, the written word of God. Uh, and that's in reference to the church. So some knowledge and revelation had already been, been uh, given and, and some was being revealed. It was a very exciting time for the church from the day of Pentecost forward. Uh, people were coming from everywhere just to hear the gospel every time jesus spoke to people there were multitudes that centered around him there were multitudes that gathered around him and when he gave himself sacrifice and his apostles continued that work they were going out preaching and teaching and uh, congregations were being started because people were obeying the gospel becoming children of god uh, but when God's will was perfectly or completely revealed, then these other things, Paul said, would stop. Uh, they would cease, as verse 8 says. Why? Why do you think they would cease when that, perf that which is perfect came about? Well, there wouldn't be any other need for them. When that which was perfect came, that which was in part, there wouldn't have any need for it. Wouldn't have any need for the proof that these apostles were from God and had to have those gifts to prove that they were from God so the people would hear them and open their hearts. But when the perfect uh, word of God was fulfilled and written and, and they had it, then these other gifts would stop. Uh, God doesn't act in any whimsical way. Uh, he doesn't act without purpose. He always has a purpose for everything that he does. Uh, he didn't do miracles uh, without a purpose. Uh, he didn't give the ability for these men to possess these miraculous gifts without a purpose. Paul was an example, uh, or uses an example in, in verse 13. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Using this as, as an example of when the church was in its infancy, or in other words, in its developmental stage, it needed all of the support that the apostles could give so that the people could understand. But when it came to maturity, when that which is perfect would come into being, uh, those things that were in part were no longer needed. Uh, they were taken away. They ceased. Think about it this way. We normally see parents and their babies and young children uh, sometimes in strollers as they push them around. I don't think I've ever seen a parent under normal situations in Walmart or anywhere I've been pushing around a teenager in a stroller. Uh, but, uh, uh, and it's for the same reason we don't have miraculous gifts in the church today. Those children grow uh, in maturity uh, as these gifts worked their uh, glory to God. They worked their benefit that God wanted them to until that which was perfect had come. And Paul said these things would cease. Uh, why do you think they would cease when, when that which was perfect was here? Well, we wouldn't need or have a need for that which was in part anymore because we've got that which was in, that's perfect. And so those things that are in part would cease and we wouldn't have any need for them. The church needed them in the days of, of its very beginning in the early church uh, when Revelation was not complete or it wasn't written yet. They needed those miraculous things. They needed the prophecy. But when God completed His revelation to mankind and confirmed it by the miracles that were used by the apostles and then gave us the perfect and complete inspired word of God which we know now and have as his word and we call it the Bible we no longer lead, need those miracles they serve their purpose God used them for that particular amount of time uh, until we had that which was perfect we need to study we need to believe uh, what God has given us 
that which is perfect. It's complete. Don't need any addition. Doesn't need to take anything away. Uh, it contains the whole truth. It's perfect and complete. And remember what the scripture says, when that which is perfect has come, that which is uh, in part shall be done away with. And certainly uh, Paul talked about miracles and them ceasing when that which is perfect would come about. Uh, some today believe that that which is perfect, again, refers to, to Jesus. But that can't be because the reference of that which is Im, uh, imperfect or incomplete becomes uh, perfect or complete. Christ wasn't imperfect. He came as perfect Son of God. He was sinless. He was perfect from the get-go. Uh, he wasn't imperfect in any way. So he was never incomplete. He was never imperfect. He was always perfect. And, and as an example, Paul used that when he was a child and, and when he was a man, and uh, it can't possibly be in reference to Jesus because he was never incomplete or, or imperfect. And not only that, Christ is never referred to in the Scripture as it. <clears throat> in the Scripture, where it talks about when that which is it, which is perfect, has come, these miracles shall cease that which is in part Christ was never referred anywhere in the word of God as it he's always referred as he or the son of God or a derivative of that which brings glory to him not as an it uh, in the book of Exodus we learn about the children of Israel and their departure from Egypt uh, they'd been in bondage for about 400 years uh, Keep in mind that there was probably around, somewhere around a million and a half people that exited out of Egypt uh, and left Egypt behind. Now, these folks had been being taken care of. They were in slavery, so to speak. They were in bondage. And the Egyptians' government was feeding them, taking care of them, but they were working them. Uh, they were in bondage as a slavery. Can you imagine what it takes to feed a million and a half people every day? Well, they soon got out of uh, the boundaries of, of Egypt and got hungry and they started complaining. Hey, we're hungry. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. We had it better back there. At least we didn't have to go in without food. We got food and we got all we wanted to eat. Uh, they started immediately complaining. Uh, think about a city that's got a million and a half people. Think about what it would take to feed those people every day. That's a lot of food. Uh, and what it would take to feed that many people today. Uh, you know, it took as much then to feed people as it does today. It would literally take tons and tons of food each and every day to feed a million and a half people. But uh, not too long after they were out of the wilderness, they ran out of food, as I said, they began to complain. Uh, but Moses interceded for them. Uh, he prayed to God, and God miraculously provided them food, and he called it manna. It had to be tons a day to feed a million and a half people. Uh, they would have consumed millions of tons of manna over that 40 year period of wandering in the wilderness. That's a lot of manna. But then God suddenly stopped the manna uh, and it was over with. Why do you think God stopped the manna? Well, what happened was God uh, didn't get angry and say, okay, I'm done with you and I'm cutting off the food. Uh, he didn't say, well, I don't no longer love you and I'm not going to take care of you. Uh, none of those things are really the reason that God stopped feeding them. The real reason was that God stopped the manna because it had served its purpose. You know why it had served its purpose? Because after 40 years, they had reached their promised land. They were reaping the benefits of this land of milk and honey. God no longer needed to supply their food. The land was able to take care of them. So what God had put into place for them, when that need was fulfilled, he stopped the other. He stopped the manna. Uh, God is a sovereign God. He can do miracles when he wants. He can stop doing miracles when he wants. But just as he stopped the manna because they had reached the promised land, he stopped miracles because they had served a purpose. Just as that manna served its purpose when the children of Israel reached 
uh, Canaan, the land of milk and honey, uh, so did the miracles uh, serve its purpose. When that which was perfect had come, then uh, those gifts stopped, they ceased. God never, uh, and I said before, God never does anything that's not in perfect harmony with, with uh, His will and His purpose. Uh, that which is perfect is in reference to the written Word of God. When the Bible was complete, the miracles ceased, and, and people argue about it. Uh, scholars argue about it today. When it's so simple to understand, it doesn't take uh, an Einstein to understand that they served their purpose and that God said they would cease and they did cease. Uh, but make no mistake about it. God is still in charge. We may not have miracle, miracles, miraculous gifts today for us as individuals, but God is still in charge. He's still minding the store, so to speak. God can do whatever God wants to do. You think God can do miracles today? Absolutely. I'm not saying that God's miracles have ceased. I'm saying that man's miracles that God had given them uh, to benefit the early church cease because that which was perfect came about. But God is, is still minding the store. He's still uh, hearing our prayers. He's still answering our prayers. He still performs miracles in this world today. His word's complete. Uh, there's no need for mankind to have those miracles because he can do all the miracles that he sees fit to do. Uh, we can only be pleasing to God when we obey his perfect word and we understand uh, what our the will is for us and what God wants us to be and do and how God wants us to obey his word. Uh, I, I am very satisfied with the knowledge that the miraculous gifts and the miracles have ceased because we have that which is perfect today. Uh, there's not a need for those miraculous things. That, can you imagine what this world would be like today if, if many of the people possessed those miraculous things? Whew. We have come to a point in this world where there's so much evil. Can you imagine what would happen if a lot of these people had been given miraculous gifts today? Whew. I hate to imagine what would go on in the world if some of the people had those gifts today. God is wise. He's all-knowing. He used those because there was a need at that particular time. We've passed that period because we have that which is perfect. Uh, we can only be pleasing to God when we obey His perfect Word and understand it. And I hope that you're, par you're, I hope that you're pleasing to God uh, and I hope that you uh, really want an eternal home in heaven. Uh, we read earlier those traits of people that were involved in all of those sinful things that have no home and have no place in heaven. I hope you're not in a, in, in a part of any of those, and I hope you want a home in heaven, and I hope you want to be pleasing to God. And in order to be pleasing to God, you must be obedient to His command uh, and obey the, obey the gospel. Uh, God's pretty clear on what it takes to, to obey the gospel. Uh, I don't care what anyone says, uh, what any other preacher says, what any other preacher makes fun of, of anyone else for. Uh, there's scripture to back these things up. Uh, we're to hear the word of God. We're to believe it. We're to be repentful. We're to confess Christ as the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of sins. Uh, if you look in the book of Acts, every single conversion in the book of Acts which is a chronological study of the church from its inception forward, every person that was converted in the book of Acts had to obey the gospel. They repented and were baptized for the remission of sin. Uh, it's not changed. It's not changed one bit for us today. It, it was perfect. It's complete. Uh, we must obey God if we want to enjoy and be in His kingdom. And I hope if you're not a Christian uh, that you'd want to become one. And I hope that if you are a Christian and maybe your walk with God, your life with God uh, has not been what it should be, but it can be better today if, you're, if your heart's in the right place and ask God to, to forgive you and, and tell Him you want to come back and you want to start afresh. 
if we can help you tonight in any way as we stand and, and sing this song of encouragement, use it as an invitation to the Lord.